My name is Vahid Chitsos, part of Elite Mastermind Group. Thank you for being here this morning, this afternoon. Thank Go you. ahead and introduce yourself for everybody. Let us know where you're tuning in from. I'm tuning in from Toronto. My name is Jeanne Foote, and I'm the founder of the Recovery Concierge. Awesome. So I got some questions for you. Why do people fear change so much? Because humans are wired for comfort. They're just wired to be comfortable, and that's within our DNA. So as soon as we start to veer from something, it feels very threatening. So that's why people just want to be comfortable. And yet, in the discomfort is where the magic really happens. So it's interesting. We need to get to know ourselves Definitely. a lot better. <laughs> I know you help a lot of people with addiction. Could I be addicted to something that's good? Absolutely. 100%. People, like, we live in a society where we're addicted to everything. Let's be honest. Like, we're addicted to bypassing the present moment, just not even being able to sit in our discomfort, which is what you talked about initially, right? Um, so as long as we're moving, we don't know what's going on for us. So whether it's people, whether it's food, whether it's, you know, substances, which is obviously very that's that's normal but the the more less ones like you know workaholism for example or perfectionism like these are good things and they actually work well for that person but they can actually undermine their ultimate performance and their happiness and well-being how do you come up to how do you how do you build the self-awareness to know that that is what you're doing because that's not i mean you're in your own bubble you're doing it I, I mean, I feel like most addicts or a lot of people that are addicted to something, whether good or bad, but in this case, I'm going to use the bad, let's say drugs, alcohol, whatever the case might be, right? They're in their own bubble. Unless somebody else brings up the, the level of awareness and tells them that they're doing, what are some of the remedies there? Because I feel like they're, they're on, you're in your own bubble. You're a workaholic, for example. You're doing it. How would you know that you're a workaholic? Well, you don't really, because all humans are programmed. Like we, we run, a, we run on our subconscious programming. So therefore, we have a very small level of awareness. It's only when we're usually in enough pain. Some of us come willingly. Some don't. Some need to have be hit over the head by two by fours and still don't wake up. But for most of us, we're the common denominator in our life and our circumstances. So for those of us who recognize, I think most people do know that they're bordered into a place of the unknown that's problematic for them, but they just don't know how to navigate life any other way. So unless they have something, a safer, better destination to go to, they can't foresee their life being any different than what it is, no matter how painful it is. So pain is not the litmus test for wanting to change. I think it's just recognizing that you are the common denominator in all that you bring in your relationships, in the circumstances. And typically people, it's not for everybody because some people just like come willingly before it's too bad. Some people never come at all. But typically it's usually three areas that fall apart for an individual. It will be either an incident with the law or an incident with their health or a relationship issue or an employment issue. And once one of those things is jeopardized, typically that would be enough to wake someone up and recognize that maybe they need to be paying attention. But not everybody comes to the table, I'll be honest with you. There are just some people who are vested in their story to their own detriment. So here's, what, based on your professional experience, what do you think is the root of it? Where, where do, or is there a common ground where you could say this happens at their childhood or this happens in their lives or this is their behavior or their parents? These things cause this person be an addict. Is there a common ground, common denominator, or for every person is different? It, it's definitely different, but typically the root cause of addiction is trauma. And trauma can be big or it could be big T or little T. It could be an incident where someone felt shamed it could be being in a, in a family environment where everybody's doing the best they can, but they're passing down what they knew from the generation before, which is not optimal, healthy parenting. It could be an incident 
there is a combination of obviously a genetic predisposition, but a predisposition doesn't mean you actually can end up becoming addicted. It means you're more vulnerable. And then if you combine that with an environment that's not optimal, that's what happens. Because you could all, you could, I mean, I don't know if you experienced it, but I could see a father who's an alcoholic and I see a son who's, who's never drank in their lives and will never do it. And then you see another son who's also alcoholic. So it, it's the same environment, same household. One chooses not to do, and the other one chooses to do. So can you say environment could be the cause of that? It's like, how, how, how does one person choose not to do it and recognize it that that is bad? I don't want to be like that. And then the other person goes, well, he does it. Let me do it too. I think that's just that just speaks to the predisposition, the vulnerability, that there is a vulnerability towards becoming, but that doesn't necessarily mean you will become. So for example, that perfect example where two siblings, like I was one of those siblings where, not a sibling, but a, a child where I said, I definitely don't want to be like this. I saw something that I did not want to be like. And so that was enough to wake me up and correct my ways. So, um, but it just depends. It, it's very nuanced. Like mental health is nuanced. It's not prescriptive like physical health. We know what to do with broken bones. We know what to do with, you know, cardiac, but we don't know what to do with mental health because there's a biological factor, which is your genetics and predisposition and vulnerabilities and your environmental as to where you live and how you grew up. And then there's a psychological level as to how this impacted just given the case you just gave, it had two different impacts on two different uh, siblings two different outcomes. So, I mean, question comes into mind. So if you take those two siblings, let's say we take them to a little village about three hours outside of LA. I'm pretty sure you can't find a village, but let's say we take them somewhere. There's no alcohol, there's no drugs, there's no, I mean, you have zero access to any of that. So your genetics will not come into play anymore because you're no longer vulnerable because you remove the substance. Not necessarily, because you can still, it can play out in any other way. Like control is a big, is a, is a problem too, right? Perfectionism is a problem. Having things- Okay, so we're not just control. talking about substance. Oh, we're talking substance only? Yeah, so if you're removed from the substance- No, 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 I'm just saying, so if, if we don't speak about substance, there are other addictions that we have Absolutely. that we need to remedy. Got Absolutely. it, cool, cool. Because I was like, if we're taking it out, it, even if I have it in my genes, if you take it out of my environment and I have no access to it, you solve that problem. Not really, because you know, I, I look at it this way, alcohol and drugs in particular, the substances, they, have, they become solutions for people who have underlying deeper issues. So like that is their coping mechanism. That's what they've turned to, to hit the easy button, which I talked about being wired for comfort in the beginning. They don't know how to manage any other way. So this just bypasses it for a very short temporary reprieve, but then it comes back with a vengeance. And that's how people get addicted because they want to feel good, but we can feel good in healthier ways. It's just that most people don't know how to do that. So they go for what's easy. And we live in a culture, obviously, as you know, where alcohol is like, you know, celebrated in every aspect of life. It's very normal to drink. And if you don't drink, you're often looked at like you've had two heads. Like, what's wrong with you? There must be a reason that you don't. Are you an alcoholic? Not that maybe it might be a health choice, right? So, you know, the society norms don't help that either for individuals. If you or someone that you have a loved one that's going through that. What would be a couple of uh, tips that you could share with us that could possibly help? Let's say I have a, let's say I have a brother-in-law. Let's say I have a brother, sister. He's a physician, attorney, workaholic, and I want to help him. What a, I can't just tell him, don't go to work, don't do this, don't do that. That's not going to work, right? Let's take a vacation. Vacation, I mean, those are, that's not going to, that's not going to have a sustainable change in their right. lives, which is going to come to my next question is how long do you have to be building that habit for it to be sustainable? But I'll let you answer the first question. The first question is if you have, if you have a loved one or you see someone you really care about and you know, they're struggling, you definitely want to be in a place where you approach them from a place of curiosity, not like, attacking them with you, you're not doing this, you're, I see you're drinking too much, you, whatever it is. So you want to be curious to say, you know, I noticed that maybe you've been drinking too much. I'm wondering, oh, drinking a lot more is 
how has this affected you? How is COVID, is, is there something going on for you? Or you may, the best way is honestly to say, I feel or I notice, and I'm just curious if everything's okay with you. Because you want to engage them in a conversation. Because obviously, if they're doing something that's unhealthy, there's a reason why. And there's something going on for that individual. So the best way is to really be neutral. And we talk about I feel statements, like coming from what this feels like for you, that that's why you want to engage with them. That's the best place. You know, like I, what I do in my work, I do a lot of mediation and coaching with individuals, with family members to approach how to approach the family, their loved ones, because they don't know. They're, and first of all, they're emotionally entangled. So they're so exasperated, it often comes out the wrong way. So if they just hit that pause and say, okay, I really want to come from a place of concern. I want to engage this person to get curious what's going on for them and neutralize the language around who's doing what. You can usually get, you can't talk to someone when there's no rapport. So you've got to start with rapport. And so if you want to approach a loved one, you have to improve the rapport, even if it's so slightly, that then you could have that next conversation. Yeah, because I was looking for the words. I was like, how do you approach that? Because that's a set. I mean, I think that's, that's a big deal, the way you approach it. Because if you approach it the wrong way, now you got the walls going up. Now you're going to have a, a little bit of a harder time to get in. So how long does it take for me to go through the therapy, meditation, whatever I'm doing to change the behavior? How long do I have to be in that state as far as days goes for me to feel that this could potentially turn into a productive habit it's a very long process i'll be honest with you it's like you're defrosting from a thaw right and you're slowly becoming more alive and more awake the whole time and there is like what they call post-acute withdrawal symptom which can last anywhere from six months to 24 months depending on what that person's been using and for how long so it is very individual but typically the first year is it's like, you know, it's like a bit of a honeymoon. Like, oh, I, I actually can do this. You're taking people who never thought they could live without alcohol and waking up and in 90 days, I go, wow, there's a bit of a temptation here, but overall I feel better. They see some immediate benefits. But then comes the, like, the next wave, which is like the reality of picking up the pieces in their life that aren't working, right? Which is what we talked about. That maybe there's a failed relationship or maybe there are some financial issues or some health issues that have just been put on pause because they've been using or drinking or whatever it may be. And now they're coming back to the reality of that or their social anxiety or the depression or whatever it is. Cause you can't assess someone when they're in acute addiction is you're not going to get an accurate benchmark. So once the substance is removed, you sort of have an understanding of what's underneath there and then you can start, but consistent habits just take time minimal to change any habit. I would say is 40 days, but you're far from, in sustainable recovery at that period of time, right? It's usually a couple year process. Got it. What is one tip that you have for entrepreneurs going through and building their business? What do you think they should watch out for? I think or burnout. Um, to be honest, I've been there myself. You know, even in a good, uh, with a noble cause to help people, you can still chilter, like you may love something and like you can find your work very invigorating and rewarding in so many ways, but you can, you can tilt the scales in, in the wrong balance, right? If you're always working and you're not allowing yourself to recharge your batteries. And what I found by, you, could, you need to slow down to go fast. It's really that simple. Give yourself some, re some room here because if you're working at 110% capacity, there's no space for anything new or possible in your life, right? So to pull back gives you that breathing room. I want to thank you so much for taking this valuable time out of your schedule and being with us this morning. Hopefully we'll get to do more. Uh, was watching your, your Instagram page. You're doing fantastic. How do people find you? They can go to the recoveryconcierge.com. And right now I actually have a free download for an emotional toolbox if they want to look, look at more of their own wellness tools. So they just go to my bio and they should be able to get it there. Awesome. Thank you so much for being here. Stay safe. Thank you. The same to you. All the best. Okay. Bye-bye. Take care.